Welcome to the Golden Age of Radio. You're listening to the new old time radio show. Classic, contemporary, fun. This podcast is brought to you by CurtainsMysteryTheater.com. If you would like to help ensure future programming, please come visit us at CurtainsMysteryTheater.com and click on our donate button. That's theater with an R-E. Thank you for your support. Agatha Christie's Poirot. From the thrill-packed pages of Agatha Christie's unforgettable stories of corpses, clues, and crime, Mutual now brings you, complete with bowler hat and brave mustache, your favorite detective, Hercule Poirot, starring Justin Niedenhofer in the case of The Careless Victim. Before meeting Hercule Poirot in his first American adventure, it seems only fitting for the millions of faithful readers who have followed the little Belgian's detective career in book form to meet the famous lady who created this famous character. So it is our privilege to present a message from Agatha Christie, introducing Hercule Poirot from London, England. The next voice you hear will be Miss Agatha Christie. I feel that this is an occasion that would have appealed to Hercule Poirot. He would have done justice to the inauguration of this radio program, and he might even have made it seem something of an international event. However, as he's heavily engaged on an investigation about what you would hear in due course. I must, as one of his oldest friends, deputize for him. The great man has his liver foibles, but really, I have the greatest affection for him, and it is a source of continuing satisfaction to me that there has been such a generous response to his appearance on my books, and I hope that it career on the radio will make many new friends for him among a wider public. Thank you, Miss Agatha Christie. And now, Mutual presents Hercule Poirot in his first American adventure, The Case of the Careless Victim. <laughs> Mademoiselle, huh? this is the cozy room apartment renting agency. When we got something to rent, yeah. I have the desire to rent an apartment. Who has it? Please, mademoiselle, do not jest. Hello, I have with me a brief dossier of my requirements. Please to read it. All right, uh, let's see. A gentleman desires a bright sun... Sunshining apartment? of uh, reasonable quietness near the heart of the city. Should be furnished with the utmost charm, French provincial, if possible. Uh, prices of no consequence as long as it is very reasonable. <laughs> Please communicate with me at the Hotel Windsor Hercules P-O-I-R-O-T Poirot. No, 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 mademoiselle. The name is Poirot. Hercule Poirot. Well, I wish you luck, Mr. Poirot. Finding an apartment, mademoiselle, is not a matter of luck. It is a matter of employing the little gray cells. If you can find an apartment for me, please, do me the kindness to inform me. I'm sure, if you'll do something for me. And what is that? If you can find an apartment for me, please do me the kindness to inform me. <laughs> Going up. Floor, please. Number five. You are new here, no? Uh, yes, sir. Only came on yesterday. You're Mr. Perrot, aren't you? Poirot. Well, Poirot. One of the boys pointed you out. Here you are, sir. Fifth floor. Mm hmm. Oh, a thousand apologies, madame. Not at all. 
It was entirely my fault. Madame appears troubled. Perhaps I may be of some slight assistance. No, I... Well, if you're sure you don't mind. But of course not. You see, it's my door. It won't open. Aha! Uh -huh. And where is this obstinate door? Eh? It's right down the corridor, room 515. If I may have the key. But that's just it. The door isn't locked. I left it open only ten minutes ago. Indeed. Madame is very trusting, eh? Hmm. Oh, here it is. You see, it's stuck. It won't budge. It is not precisely stuck, madame. It gives a trifle. This door is barricaded. Oh, my goodness. Uh, ah, voila. She moves, eh? Oh, thanks a million. Now, what do you suppose... Uh, no, I... wait, madame. Perhaps it is better if I look first. Ah, alas, it is as I have feared. What is it? You do not know? Look! Oh, it's a man. Is he... Is he... Oui, madame. He has been strangled. This is murder. <laughs> Zutalo, I must compliment you, madame. Your color, it is excellent. And you did not even comment to fate for one who... Don't fall apart in a crisis, if that's what you mean. And furthermore, I'm not Madame, I'm Mademoiselle, by choice, Miss Abigail Fletcher. And now, if you'll get that uh, corpse out of here, I'd like to sit down. That I regret I cannot do, Mademoiselle. The body must not be touched before the police arrive. Police? Well, yes, of course, the police. I am calling them now. Hello, hello? Ah, Inspector Stevens, it is I, Hercule Poirot. Alas, no, I have not yet found the apartment, but I have found something of perhaps more interest, a corpse. Mm, right here in my hotel, uh, room number... 515. Number 515. Mademoiselle, what are you doing with the body? Nothing. I, I was just trying to see his face. You will have that opportunity later. Pardon, Inspector. We are room 515. Bien. We shall expect you immediately. A bien, Miss Fletcher. Now that you have observed the face of this unfortunate one, perhaps you will be good enough to tell me who he is? I certainly will not. Who do you think you are? Ah, mademoiselle, permit me to present myself. I am Hercule Poirot, formerly chief of the Belgian Charte. Yeah, that's what you say. Now look, Mr. Poirot, I've read plenty of detective stories, and none of them had a detective that looked anything like you. I'll wait for the police and let them ask the questions. As you desire, mademoiselle. I merely wish to point out one thing. It is you the police will question first. Me? But of course, you are the most likely suspect, no? Well, all right. Uh, what do you want to know? First... What are you doing here in this hotel? Why, I've lived here for ten solid years, ever since I left Waskuskigo, Maine. And what do you do? What is your occupation? Why, why, I, uh, don't have any occupation. I, I've got a little income and, um, I like it here in New York. In the last few years I've been doing, um, uh, war work. Red Cross and things like that. You seem a trifle vague, mademoiselle. No. About this man, who is he? I don't know. I never saw him before in my life. Mademoiselle, I advise you to consider your answers with care. Do not forget, a man lies dead in this room. I can't help that. I don't know who he is or how he got here. I told you, I was out of the room for uh, ten minutes. That may be, Miss Flasher, but it does not help you. This man has been dead for at least one hour. How do you know? If you will touch the body, you will observe it is already beginning to queue. Therefore, Mademoiselle, if you left this room only ten minutes ago, your situation is indeed grave. For this man was already dead. Oh, but uh, I couldn't have done it. So? And why not? Because his body was lying right across the doorway. You know perfectly well I couldn't get out through this doorway and still leave a body wedged against it. 
Belgian surety, indeed. Mm, very good, mademoiselle. But you could have murdered him in here, made your departure by way of this fire escape to the room overhead, and came down inside the building to this corridor where you saw innocently made my acquaintance. You see, there is evidence that the fire escape has been recently been used. Now, it is not so amusing, eh? Well, I don't care. I had nothing to do with this. I know you detectives. You are out to get a suspect. And just because a man was murdered in my room... Gently, doesn't... gently, mademoiselle. All is not lost. Fortunately, you deal with Hercule Poirot, who goes one step beyond the obvious. You see, this poor man was not melted in your room. He was killed in the room overhead. But why? Why kill him upstairs and leave him on my doorstep? That, mademoiselle, we shall discover in due course. <laughs> All right, Mr. Perot, now that you've got the corpse safely locked in my room and us outside, what am I supposed to do? Sleep on the fire escape? I do not think that will be necessary, mademoiselle. You are coming with me to the lobby where we shall wait for my friend, Inspector Stevens. He will see that you are comfortably sheltered for the night. Oh! Tell me, Mr. Perot, how'd you figure out that the murder took place upstairs? Is it not apparent, Miss Fletcher? Please to squeeze the bell for the elevator. I look out of your window and observe the fire escapes, and what do I find? Everywhere the dust reposes peacefully. Well, naturally. The help is too busy to polish fire escapes. Ah, ah, mademoiselle. But on one stairway, the one leading up from your window, all is disarranged. There is a broad, clever path through the dust and at precisely the width of a human body. And since the path extends only to the floor above, it is obvious that the body has been dragged down from room 615. Also, on the garment of the dead man, the trousers, the left elbow, and across the shoulders, there are unmistakable traces of rust. Ah, voila, the elevator. Going down. Monsieur. Would you be so kind as to explain why you were so long in arriving? Uh, oh, it's this old car. Every once in a while it goes on the fritz. Coma? On the fritz? Out of order? Yeah, it, it got stuck on the ninth. You have been on the ninth floor all this time. Yeah, that's right. That is difficult to believe. Why? Because the indicator has been pointing to the basement. Ah, that, that indicator. As soon as anything goes wrong, it flops. I am not so sure that is true of the indicator, but unquestionably, monsieur, it is true of the too clever murder. As soon as anything goes wrong, it flops. ABN, Inspector Stevens, there is the situation. An unknown man strangled to death in one room and dragged down the fire escape to another. Poirot, if this body is the person I think it is, the commissioner will have my head. Eh, mon ami, forgive me, you'll seem agitated. We were warned, too. I sign my best man to guard him. The smartest cop on my force, Sam Treble. Good lord, Poirot, there will be an international scandal. Gently, mon ami, you go too fast, even for Hercule Poirot. Who is this magnificent figure of international importance? Parrish. Jonathan Parrish. Parrish? Ah, oui, the name rings a bell. He is the big currency expert, eh? That's right. He was on his way to Europe to set up the new paper currency for the liberated countries, checked in at the Windsor today, was supposed to pick up some papers, dyes, and inks, and then hop a bomber tonight. Fifth floor, please. An enormous undertaking, and one of great importance. And I was responsible for his safety. He's supposed to be an eccentric sort of guy. No photographs, no publicity. Tremble was the only man on the force who knew him at all, and Tremble failed. You see what this means, Poirot? I see only this, my friend. 
we have arrived at the first step in the solution of this distressing murder. For now, we know the motive. This way, Inspector. This is the room. Mademoiselle Flachiel, your key. Here you are. I will never live this down. You exaggerate, mon ami. Even the best of men sometimes fail. Regard, Inspector. Here is your corpse. Hmm. They certainly did a job. Thunderation! You are shot, monsieur. Poirot, do you realize what's happened? But of course, Inspector. It is not Jonathan Parrish who has been murdered, but your own faithful policeman, Sam Tremble. Poirot, that's not funny. You knew all the time. Pardon, mon ami. I knew nothing of the sort. But you distinctively told me that... No, Inspector. You told me. Told me that the man was an unknown corpse. It could be anyone. But when you speak of two men, one a wealthy financier of international importance, the other a police officer, by employing the little gray cells, it is not quite difficult to conclude that a corpse with the large, high, comfortable shoes and the plain suit is the policeman. Oh. Of, of course. I'm Monsieur, sorry. there is no time now for the profuse apologies. You're right. We've got to get to Parish at once. The poor guy doesn't even know his bodyguard's gone. Hello. Hello, operator. Uh, what room is Jonathan Parrish in? Eh? 615. Hold on. Poirot, that's the room directly over this one where Tremble was killed. Precisely. Operator, let me talk to Mr. Parrish. I think you will find the gentleman does not answer. Why not? Obviously, he will not witness a murder without reporting it. On the other hand, he too may... Good lord, Poirot, do you think he's dead too? He... we know he received a warning from Hillary Kent. I do not follow you, mon ami. Huh? Oh, I don't blame you. Hillary Kent is a criminal egomaniac. Ah, one who commits crime chiefly for the pleasure of baffling the police, eh? eh? Exactly. Well, this Hillary Kent, or someone who calls himself Hillary Kent, is one of those guys. He pulled off a few clever jobs and got away with them. We don't know anything about him, but whoever he is, he's got to get his thrill out of every job, so he makes it a rule to warn his victims. Ah, oui. I know well the time. And Monsieur Parrish, I take it, has received such a warning? Right. So now you see why I assign my best man. Eh bien. But now we must hasten upstairs to Mr. Parrish's room. Already, it may be too late. I'll go too. I don't want to stay here with this body. You'll stay right here, Miss Fletcher, until I give you permission. Inspector, if you do not mind. Myself, I am not averse to Miss Fletcher's company. I found her very intriguing. Oh? No answer. But naturally, you do not expect the murderer to sit down and wait for us. You will have to employ the passkey. Remember, Miss Fletcher, you're not to touch anything. It's perfectly all right. I'm wearing gloves. The inspector is thinking of fingerprints. Moi, I do not think he will find any. Monsieur Kent, or whoever the killer may be, is too clever to leave any such traces. Well, maybe, but I want to be sure that we don't lose even the tiniest clue. An excellent approach, mon ami. There are many interesting things we may learn here about Monsieur Parrish. He certainly gets around a lot. Oui. The labels on his luggage are from the four corners of the earth. Miss Fletcher, I said you are not to touch anything. For goodness sake, it's only a book. Books may be of great significance. Ah, oui. This one, for example. It is no ordinary book. It is a stamp album of great value. Hmm. Some of these stamps are almost without price. Ah, ah, very interesting. This Guatemala blue... Put up your hands, all of you. Oh, Thunderation! Don't move, I said don't move. Have no fear, monsieur. I will not dispute the authority of your gun. Motion picture stars arrive in Washington to aid in the nation's campaign to sell war bonds. 
Riding in army cars, the celebrities parade through the streets of the capital. Stars known to cinema fans all over the world. James Cagney. Lucille Ball. Fred Astaire. From atop the Washington Monument, we look down into an arena as thousands gather to cheer their favorites. Harpo Marx. Greer Garson. A parade of the Army's famous jeeps, and the slogan is, Back the Attack. Little Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, all aiding the cause as the people of America invest in government bonds to win the war. Mister, you can't get away with this. Put your gun down and talk fast. Who the devil are you? But obviously, Inspector, this is the man we seek. Monsieur Jonathan Paris. That's just who I am. All right, speak up. Which one of you is Hillary Kent? Hillary Kent? Yes. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Mr. Parrish. You've got this all wrong. I'm Inspector Stevens, Homicide Squad, and this is Hercule Poirot, the famous Belgian detective. So you say. You don't look like policemen to me, particularly that little squirt with a silly mustache. Eh? You stay right where you are till I check on you. Eh bien, Monsieur Parrish, now that you are satisfied as to our identity... Well, I've heard of you, of course. You're supposed to be the greatest French detective in the world. Oh, always people say that about me, Monsieur, but... It is not entirely true. I am not French. I am Belgian. <laughs> well, I wish you'd all get out of here and leave me alone. I'm expecting my daughter and I don't want her running into a room full of policemen. But Monsieur, you are in great danger. You must be protected every moment. You offer me police protection? <laughs> not worth a hoot. <laughs> I beg your pardon? That's what I said, not worth a hoot. I have protection. Some detective they assigned to me. Where is he? He is dead. What? He was murdered in this very room while protecting you. Therefore, if you do not object too violently, I shall undertake to protect you until you step aboard your airplane. All right, all right. Stay. I don't know how long it'll be. I I'm just waiting for one little parcel to be delivered, and then I'm off. Monsieur is taking with him much equipment. Yes, quite a load. I've already sent most of it off to the airport. Ah, bon, that is good. Miss, don't eat that chocolate, it may be poison. Oh, nonsense, this candy isn't poisoned. I wouldn't be too sure. That box of candy supposedly came from my daughter, Laura. It was delivered a little while ago. <clears throat> but you suspect she did not send it? Well, she's supposed to come here in person. Should be here now, in fact. So why should she send it? You are a very shrewd, mon ami. Hi. Uh, oh, ex excuse me. Uh, wait a minute, Johnny. Come back here. What do you want? Nothing. I... I just wanted to see if Mr. Parrish got his extra laundry box okay. Oh, yes, yes, I received it. Uh, okay. Excuse me. I, uh, uh, picked up a few more things to take along. The special dyes and inks. Uh, They'll just about fill up that laundry box. Yeah, if you'll excuse me, I've got to go into the bedroom and finish packing. Crusty old bird, isn't he? How would you be if you knew someone was out to kill you? No wonder he's jittery. Ah, he's irritated and nervous. That perhaps explains it. Explains what? Why he wears upon his feet that unique pair of socks, one of which is green and the other brown. All right, if the man wants to be eccentric, let him be. I've still got a murderer to catch. You want to come along? No, Inspector. I have attached myself to Monsieur Parrish, and I propose to see that. Come in. Inspector, one of the two men found this on the sidewalk outside of the hotel. Thought you might want to take a look at it before turning it into the lost and found. Okay, Brady, thanks. 
a lady's purse. Usual assortment of stuff. Cosmetics, perfume, change, keys. Do you make anything of it, Poirot? Hmm. Hmm. Ah, sacre bleu! What is it? These initials. LP. Monsieur Parish. Yeah? What did you say was the name of your charming daughter? Laura. Good Lord! LP. Laura Parish. Boy, bro, where are you going? I have a little idea. Uh, Mademoiselle Flasher, please to accompany me. How about Mr. Parish? You were so attached to him. I have become momentarily detached. I leave him in your care. Inspector, protect him with the apple of your eye. <laughs> Come, come. It must be the first time you have left the elevator unattended. Monsieur Johnny, come along. Mr. Poro, you're wasting your time in this basement, believe me. Nevertheless, it interests me. Please to light the way. There's nothing here, just a lot of ash cans. One moment. What is behind this door? Well, that's the laundry bin. They keep the soiled linen in there. You won't find anything in there. Shall we take a brief glance, huh? There, you see? Nothing but a pile of dirty sheets and a pillowcases. Good gracious, what a laundry bill they must have. A B N. Let us proceed to... One moment. What is it? Sacre bleu, protruding from under the sheets. Holy cow! A foot. A small foot, this is what I feel. Look! Ah, it moves. Then we are not too late. Quickly, monsieur, help me to uncover her. That's all I know, Mr. Perrault. I was walking along the street toward the hotel. Just as I passed the alley, I was pulled in. I tried to scream, but something was pressed against my mouth. Chloroform, Miss Parrish. Had you seen your assailant, you would have seen Hilary Kent. Hello, Miss Parrish. You are most fortunate. Another few minutes under those linens, and who knows? Voila. Here is the room of your father. Inspector Stevens, here is Miss Parrish. Oh, well, that's a relief. Come in. I was afraid, Poirot, you'd turn up with a body. How did you manage to find her? That is not important now. We have found her, but we seem to have lost their father. Oh, yes. Miss Parrish, I'm sorry. Your father's terribly upset about you, but his material was delivered and he had to rush off to the airport. Oh, no! Don't tell me I missed him after all this! Ah, oh, ma pauvre petite! Have we neglected you, huh? Miss Flesher, your room is now free of corpses. Please take Mademoiselle Paris down and extend to her their first aid. Come along, Laura. Thank you. Inspector. I hope you do not later have cause to regret that you permitted Paris to go off to the airport unprotected. You'll be all right. Besides, I've got a job to do here. Although, frankly, I'm in a complete fog. I can't make head or tail of this whole business. No, Stevens. The head and the tail we have. What? Yes. It is merely a fragment of the method that we still lack. Well, who is it? Hey! Poirot, where are you going? To see how Miss Parrish is and to telephone the airport to see that Mr. Parrish receives the proper attention. Au revoir. Mr. Perot, where are you taking me now? I'd like to have some... Mr. Perot, Mr. Perot. Hello? Someone calls. Oh, it's Johnny in that parked car. Mr. Perot, I got a message for you from Inspector Stevens. He rushed off a minute ago. From Stevens? What is it? What is the message? He says he just got word that Mr. Parrish has been seriously hurt in an automobile accident on North Salem Road. Mon dieu, this is too much. You're to get there as fast as you can. Here's the address. 52 North Salem Road. Monsieur, your duties for the day are over? Yeah. And this is your vehicle? Yeah, why? There is no time to seek a taxi, so I will impose on your kindness. Miss Flachiel, quickly, please. Okay. North Salem Road, right? No. To the airport. 
What? But Mr. Parrish isn't at the airport. He's injured on North Salem Road. No, mademoiselle. That is what I was intended to believe. Do you not think so, Johnny? He is kept there, I assure you. How do you know? Well, North Salem Road is not on the way to the airport. It is in the opposite direction. This is merely a trick to keep us from the flying field. We must hurry there before it is too late. Well, the airplane is still there, but I don't see anything amiss. Hola. Over there. Parish, as large as life. Yep, that's him all right. Come along, please. Uh-uh. Both of you. Monsieur Parish. Monsieur Poirot. Uh, my daughter, is she... She is safe at the hotel, Monsieur Rustine. She has had a small misadventure, but she is entirely safe. Oh, thank heavens. You are relieved, eh? Am I? I I don't think I'd have gotten on that plane if you hadn't found her. Fortunately, I didn't have to. Uh, they've been delayed a little. Poirot! Inspector Stevens, I knew you would not walk into the trap. Yeah, but as usual, you beat me to it. I was halfway out to North Salem Road before I realized what was cooking. A bien. Yeah, is Mr. Parrish safe and sound, eh? I suggest the bomber be expected with great care. There may be sabotage. Good idea. Also, have all the doors of this building guarded. Uh, Mr. Perot, do I have to hang around here? But of course, Johnny. We may require you for our return trip. Oh, Monsieur Parrish, here is your pilot to report. Right now, Mr. Parrish. Thank you. Oh, Captain, uh, here comes my luggage. Will you see that it gets aboard? Right, sir. And be especially careful of that wooden crate. Well, goodbye, Inspector. I must admit you've been extremely helpful, and I'm much obliged. Not at all. Goodbye and happy landing. Miss Fletcher. Goodbye, sir. Monsieur Poirot, it's been a privilege to know you. I'm only sorry I couldn't remain to see you break the case. But you are, monsieur. I beg your pardon? The case. It is broken. Inspector, meet Hillary Kent. The gentleman to whom you have just wished, bon voyage. Hillary Kent? You're mad, Perot. Good gracious, I thought he was Paris. And that wooden crate, I will have waited so long to see. It is not to be moved, Inspector. Why not? Because, mon ami, it contains the body of Jonathan Parrish. <laughs> A charming restaurant, this Nespa. The plane circling about gives one the feeling of flying, eh? Ooh, the feeling I've got. If that's what flying gives you, keep me from it. Ah, that is natural. I too do not like murder, Miss Fleshier. Ah, Inspector Stevens. Everything is taken care of? Yes, they're taking Kent away now. Then perhaps you will join us in a little supper? No thanks, Poirot. I've got to get back. I, um, uh, just dropped over to ask a few questions. For example? Well, when did you first suspect that Kent was impersonating Parrish? Almost from the start. When we entered the room of Monsieur Parrish, what do we find, eh? An amazing paradox. On the one hand, we have a man who is an ardent stamp collector, whose album is in perfect order. Each stamp, each shade of stamp, precisely in its proper place, eh? Except the most valuable one of all, a Guatemala blue, reposing among American three stamps, which are green. Later, when I look at his socks, one green and one brown, I am certain the man in the room is colorblind. And therefore not perish the stamp collector. More important than that, he cannot be perished the currency expert who is to select the colors and shades of the new paper money, eh? Therefore, if the man in the room is not Parrish, who is he? Obviously, Hillary Kent. Without a body, one cannot prove a murder. And I felt sure Monsieur Kent would lead me to the body. Then you weren't guarding him, you were watching him. Precisely. Well, you weren't so smart. When you let him out of your sight, he might have gotten away in the plane. Not at all. 
When I called the airport, it was to make sure that the plane would not leave until I gave the word. You know everything, don't you? Some things are obvious, mademoiselle. We can suppose Hillary Kent discovered the nature of the mission Monsieur Parrish is engaged in. Ah, what a magnificent opportunity for a swindler, huh? Perhaps the greatest in history to remove Jonathan Parrish, fly to Europe as Parrish, deliver the papers, the formulas, the dies to the proper authorities, and then at the moment just counterfeit their new currency and repay a huge fortune. Jumping codfish! The man must be mad! Perhaps, mademoiselle. But he is also a genius, eh? He learned that Paris is at the Hotel Windsor in room 615. He knocks on the door. Paris admits him and is at once strangled to death, eh? But the body. Ah, that must be disposed of while no one will find it. There is but one thing to do. Take the body to Europe in the very packing case which stands in their room. Then you just guessed where the body was. <laughs> no, no, Inspector. There was proof in their room. You remember the second laundry box which Eric can ask for? This is for <laughs> some special ink, he says to us, which I have only now purchased. Obviously, this is a lie. On such a mission, one does not purchase supplies at the last minute, eh? Hence, I know. These inks and dyes have been removed from some other box or crate to make room for the body. Gracious! It's as plain as a nose on my face. Ah, uh, what about Laura Parrish? Oh, I got that figured out. She calls up and says to Ken, Pop, I'm coming over. Of course, he can't allow that or the jig's up. So he gets down to the alley and eliminates her. Right, Poro? Exactly. As for Paul Tremble, he has been with Paris. She knows him. When he knocks on the door and Kent appears, he demands to see Paris. Kent kills him. And since the packing case is already occupied, drags him down to Miss Precious' room. That was his big mistake. He should never have started up with me. <laughs> Uh, excuse me for a minute, I think the ward wagon is pulling in. Mademoiselle, may I ask you a question of a personal nature? Fire away! Uh, Mademoiselle, you are not now engaged in a business enterprise? No. Are you fluent with the shorthand and the typewriter? Why, yes. Bon, Mademoiselle, I find you both intelligent and amusing. A rare combination in a woman. Moreover, I am in great need of a secretary with your superb qualifications. Why, Mr. Perot! You do not yet employ the little gray cells to the best advantage. Nevertheless, if you are interested... Oh, Mr. Perot! For ten years I've been devouring detective stories, and you ask me if I'm interested? Chief, you've got a secretary! Well, Poirot, they've taken Ken away now. I guess that winds up the case. Not quite, Inspector. Tell me, where does Monsieur Kent reside? We found a lease on him for an apartment in Gramercy Park. That is a good neighborhood? Oh, swell. It's right in the heart of the city. But why do you ask? I do not think Monsieur Kent will need an apartment for some time. But I do. You see, my friends, it is as I have said. To find an apartment in New York City <clears throat> is the essence of simplicity. One has only to solve two murders. Be sure to listen next week when Agatha Christie, America's favorite mystery writer, brings you her favorite detective, Hercule Poirot, in the case of Murder by the Sea. Agatha Christie's Poirot is directed by Mark Seven. This episode of The Case of the Careless Victim featured Justin Edenhofer as the titular character, Hercule Poirot. Miss Fletcher and Agatha Christie were played by Lisa Bratz, and Inspector Stevens was played by Matthew J. Wilkes. Nathan Jarrows played Johnny in the pilot. Haley Reese Calhoun played Laura Parrish and the clerk, and Mark Seven played Jonathan Parrish and your announcer. 
The new old time radio show is getting just a little bit newer. Now you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and even more streaming services. To learn more, visit us at anchor.fm slash the new old time radio show. That's a n c h o r dot f m slash the new old time radio show. And as always, please remember to click the donate button, like us on Facebook, leave a review, or tell two or three hundred of your closest personal friends about the new old time radio show. We are committed to hiring professional actors and technical staff through the COVID nineteen pandemic, and your continued support keeps this podcast going. Thank you. We'll see you in two weeks when the new old time radio 